Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the New York Historical Society. I'm Louise Mirer, New York Historical's president and CEO, and I'm really thrilled to see all of you here in our beautiful Robert H. Smith Auditorium. Tonight's program, Religion and Gender, the Good, the Bad, and the Future, is part of our continuing series this month for the eighth annual Diane and Adam E. Max Conference on Women's History. The conference was the brainchild of Diane Max and her late husband, Adam, under the leadership of our Center for Women's History founding director, Valerie Paley, the conference was first held in 2016, even before the physical contours of our Center for Women's History took shape. We are very grateful indeed to the Maxes for the imagination and impetus that set this annual conference in motion, and of course, to my colleague, Valerie Paley, for her leadership. The Center for Women's History is the first such center of its kind within the walls of a major museum in the United States. In only a few short years, we have been able to accomplish an extraordinary amount in terms of scholarship, education, programs, collecting, and not least of all, exhibitions, all of which foreground women's critical role in American history. Since 2017, the Joyce B. Cowan Women's History Gallery has been the venue for such important exhibitions, including our current one on view right now on the fourth floor, Carol Walker Harper's Pictorial History of the Civil War Annotated. We're indebted to Joyce Cowan for her visionary support. Our theme for the Max Conference programs this year is keeping the faith, sex, gender, and religion. When we look at the divisions fracturing society today, many of us point to organized religion as a restrictive force regulating and limiting gender roles. Yet faith-based communities have also provided avenues for women and LGBTQ plus individuals to pursue leadership opportunities and to pursue and to push for broader gender equality from within their traditions, complicating any simple views of religion and partisanship. The many intersections of this topic are particularly important to New York Historical, not only because of the work of the Center for Women's History, but because of the ways we are expanding our institution's footprint to encompass larger issues of gender, as well as to welcome the American LGBTQ plus museum into its first ever physical home in our new wing, which will be computed, completed in just a few years. The museum's executive director, Ben Garcia, has joined us this evening, and I want to recognize and thank Ben for his colleagueship. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> now then, to our speakers. Mitchell Gold is best known for creating Mitchell Gold plus Bob Williams, one of America's most prestigious and best known home furnishing retailers and manufacturers. Over the past 25 years, he has also advocated for LGBTQ plus and children's rights related to religion, religion based bigotry. Mitchell was appointed by North Carolina Governor Cooper to sit on the North Carolina Business Council and the North Carolina Child Care Commission. It was actually Mitchell's passionate plea for us at New York Historical to pay closer attention to the role of religion in the themes that we treat that engendered the topic of our MAX conference this year. And of course, what could be timelier as we contemplate recent legislation and the decisions of the United States Supreme Court. Mitchell is the author of a, a, a path-breaking and very moving um, and important book called Crisis, which includes 40 stories of, uh, of growing up gay in America. I highly recommend it to you. It, has left, uh, as I said to Mitchell earlier this evening, um, a deep and searing impact on my consciousness, and, uh, and it is um, really a very, very important and revealing book to understand the history of the LGBTQ plus community in America. The Reverend Professor Dr. David P. Gushy is Distinguished Professor of Christian Ethics at Mercer University, Chair of Christian Social Ethics, at Freie Universität in Amsterdam and Senior Research Fellow, International Baptist Theological Studies Center. 
He's also the elected past president of the American Academy of Religion and the Society of Christian Ethics. Dr. Gushy is the author, co-author, or editor of 27 books, including the bestsellers Kingdom Ethics and Changing Our Mind. Gushy and his wife, Jeannie, live in Atlanta. Catherine Stewart, our moderator this evening, writes about the religious rights influence on politics, policy, and law. Her latest book, The Power Worshippers, Inside the Dangerous Rise of Religious Nationalism, won first place for excellence in nonfiction books from the Religion News Association. Her work appears in the New York Times, New Republic, and others. As I uh, yield the stage to our distinguished speakers this evening, as always, I want to ask that you please make sure that anything that makes a noise like a cell phone is switched off. And now, please join me in welcoming tonight's guests. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And thanks to everyone at the New York Historical Society for this uh, really terrific series. It's an honor to be in conversation uh, to, uh, with Mitchell Gold and David Gushy. And um, I want to thank all of you uh, in the audience for joining together today uh, for this, uh, this uh, discussion. So before we begin, I want to ask you, um, and I'd love to see a show of hands. How many of you are concerned about the direction of our democracy? OK. Um, how many of you are concerned about uh, political polarization? Again, uh, about the normalization of conspiracism and disinformation? And how many of you feel that your rights and the rights of your loved ones have been imperiled? Large numbers. So I see that you are as concerned as we are. Um, and that's why we're here for this discussion. But we can't understand the polarization that we're seeing in our culture. We can't understand the mainstream of conspiracism and the attack on our rights without considering the, uh, the misuse of religion, with the weaponization of religion, a kind of um, uh, religious authoritarianism, rising religious authoritarianism that we're seeing in our country that's driving so much of the polarization, driving so many of the attacks on our rights. So um, tonight I want to, and it's actually imperiling our democracy itself, itself. So our conversation tonight is going to be focused on women's rights and LGBTQ uh, equality, but, uh, and the threats to both, and how they're interconnected. But there's also a bigger picture here. And uh, Mitchell and David have both written and spoken about these threats at length. So I'd uh, like to open the conversation with you, Mitchell. You've been alert to these issues for over 25 years. And uh, I, I want you to tell us a little bit about your journey and what you've learned. Well, my journey really started more than 25 years ago, and it was in the 60s. I remember sitting in the den with my mother watching TV, and George Wallace was on TV and said, segregation now, segregation forever. It says it in the Bible. And I looked at my mother. I think I was 11 or 12 years old. And I said, does it say that in the Bible? And she said, it doesn't say it in our Bible. And then we had a conversation about how different religions believe different things. And growing up in the 60s, I really saw a lot of um, the use of the Bible to justify the, uh, the bigotry against African American people. And then fast forward to the 90s when Bill Clinton uh, wanted to have gays and lesbians in the military. The biggest outcry that I saw, and I was living in North Carolina by then, uh, the biggest outcry that I saw was ministers, Baptist ministers especially, were very vocal about how well, we can't have these immoral people in the foxholes with us. And it was interesting to me because my friends in New York were hearing a different story. They were hearing, oh, they don't want gays in the military um, because of an ick factor, because they thought gays were icky. And, and, and there was a big study that they were claiming there was a study done about it. But anyway, but I, but I really became aware that Living, especially living down south, that there is this movement of people using their religious beliefs to justify their bigotry. And that got me going. That's really interesting that your journey began in the past, because the religious right, as, 
as we see it today, has sort of come from an earlier time. And I'd love to hear from you, uh, David, about how the movement and has, has evolved over time. Uh, I think you could begin the story at a lot of different places, but I think probably the most relevant place to begin is late 60s to mid 70s uh, with a conservative religious reaction to social change, all the social changes of the 60s, um, sexual revolution, movement for gay rights, uh, women's movement, uh, and of course civil rights movement. Uh, the, the Vietnam War and the protests against it, are, I think, are a part of the story, too, as well as uh, the immigration laws uh, loosening to allow a lot of immigrants. And I, I think we are still fighting the, the battles of the 60s and the backlash thereof. But the, the first iteration of the religious right is, is a late 60s, early 70s movement um, that said that they were mainly about being opposed to abortion, Roe versus Wade. The new right. The new right, the new together. religious right. Mm -hmm. But it's clear even from the documentation that, that especially the southern branch of this movement was mainly upset about the state outlawing segregation. Yeah. Um, and, and so since that, you know, Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson era of the 70s, we've seen multiple versions of the religious right some of you may remember, remember compassionate conservatism, um, family values conservatism, uh, which it ends up morphing into the Tea Party during the Obama years, and, and then it, it goes over to uh, the MAGA movement in the Trump years, and, and then a certain number of extremists were found on January 6th in the Capitol. So I would say it is a counter it is a reactionary and authoritarian movement that you can trace at least back to the 60s, and it's a major factor in our public life today. Thank you. So it's a kind of hyper-conservative counter-revolution, as it were. Yeah, that's the way I think they would see themselves as counter-revolutionaries yeah. in an apocalyptic battle to fight for American society as they want to see it. Mitchell, you've written a book about the mental health crisis among teens and the trauma of growing up. Uh, in proximity to a kinds of religion that uh, deny LGBTQ individuals their full range of human expression, the right to intimacy, and, um, and the legitimacy, of course, of same-sex love and intimacy. So can you speak about those harms? In a very real way. <laughs> you know, there, there's a lot of statistics out there um, one, one, uh, LGBT kids are eight times more likely to suffer mental anguish. Uh, they're eight times more likely to do drugs and abuse drugs be to kind of uh, soften their pain, uh, more likely to think, have suicidal thoughts, more likely to commit suicide. And I like to say, I don't know exactly what the statistics are, but I can only tell you from my own personal expression, my own, own personal experience, growing up in the 60s when homosexuality was against the law, and it was considered a mental disorder. Um, it was a really, really tough time for me. And I remember back like yesterday, sitting in Mrs. Haberman's class in sixth grade reading Leviticus. Um, and when it said, man shall not lay with man as one woman, will be put to death, blah, blah. And it was the time, as 11 years old or so, when I was starting to think about my relationship to men, and it was just devastating to me. I just didn't understand what was going on. And, mm -hmm through my teen years, for the next 10 years, I'm embarrassed to say how many times I cried myself to sleep, how many times I laid in bed and just wondered, what did I do wrong? Why, did God, why was God doing this to me? And I have met so many kids today, you know, within the last month, uh, who have had similar experiences. It still goes on today. And it goes on because, you know, the, the, the biggest part of it is because people grow up in a home it could be Reformed Judaism at the time, which no longer believes that, no longer teaches that. But when you grow up in a home where you're taught that you're a sinner, that is the thing that can break a kid's back. And I think that's, that, that, that to me is really the goal, to get LGBT off the sin list. Yeah. If we can do that, we will solve a mental health. In fact, at the end of the book that I wrote, I said, you know, there's many things that are difficult to solve in life. 
this is easy to solve. Change that teaching, the mental anguish, the mental health issues will sub substantially demise. In order to do that, of course, we have to shift this idea that there are sort of hierarchies of humanity, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, the idea of hierarchy has long been a feature of the religious right. Uh, we can look back to the era of slavery, in fact, when pro-slavery theologians like Robert Louis Dabney, James Henley Thornwell called uh, slavery God's established order. Uh, we can look to um, what they call the slave system or ordained by God, and, and, and many leaders of major denominations um, either tolerated uh, enslavement of, of human beings or, or promoted it. Um, not all, of course, but the leaders of uh, many major denominations. And then we can see a through line to the era of um, segregation when Bob Jones Sr. Uh, called uh, slavery God's established order and uh, said, you know, segregation is scriptural. And that sort of idea of hierarchy, I, I think religious right leaders are too clever today to openly endorse segregation. But um, the idea of hierarchy is, is still very much alive. The, there are still many um, religious uh, right leaders who claim that men should rightly dominate over women. That they, they, um, they uh, talk about how that's sort of a God's established order. Uh, and they sometimes give it a, a kind name like complementarianism. They say, oh, men and women are, are equal in God's eyes, but they have different roles, which always gives the male power over the woman. So, um, and of course, the hierarchy of, of, uh, of sexual orientation you know, is, is, a, is, is an extension of that in many ways. So, David, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about male headship. And I'd also like to hear you talk about some of the wonderful writers like Kristen Kobes de May and uh, Beth Allison Barr, who are really pushing back. Uh, 30 years ago, I was um, at a seminary teaching at the very beginning of my career. And uh, when I entered that school as a junior professor, um, I told them, I believe that God's plan is for men and women to be equal and for uh, there to be no distinction in terms of what roles um, women can occupy. In other words, if a woman is called to be a pastor, then women should be able to be pastors and just like men. And in the summer of 1993, that was an okay position and I got hired. And a year and a half later, that was ruled an, uh, an inappropriate position and I was not gonna be able to stay. Um, this immutable doctrine uh, uh, changed in a year and a half, you know, during the time that I was there under new leadership. Uh, and that has not gone away. The idea that God set up a world in which men are supposed to lead in family, church, they, they don't say in society as much anymore, but it's meant. And women are supposed to graciously submit in all arenas. That is now doctrine um, in, in the Southern Baptist Convention, it's in their doctrinal statement and in some other denominations too. And the theological basis for it is, well, one, one basis of it is the idea of male headship based on one verse in the New Testament uh, where the men are the, like the head of everything and the women are subordinate. Um, there's a whole lot of us who are fighting hard against this and who argue that this is not only a misreading of how God set up the world, but it also has um, documentable damaging effects in relationships, in families, in churches, in every, every place. Um, these two writers who you mentioned who are uh, really admirable, Kristen Dumay wrote a book called Jesus and John Wayne that everybody should read. Um, and she documents what essentially various expressions of toxic masculinity in the evangelical subculture. Um, and uh, Beth Allison Barr wrote a book about, about uh, the long history of Christian teaching about gender roles and shows that it, it hasn't been a part of Christian doctrine over 2,000 years. There have been various opinions and various expressions. And so uh, there's historical work being done. Um, uh, there's other kind of work being done. But I mean, I put out a tweet today uh, 
saying, I oppose patriarchy, and here's a chapter that I wrote about it, and somebody went on there to say, you'll never win this fight. God's ordering of creation will never be changed. And that's how, that's how it's looked at, and it's a real thing. That's so interesting. I mean, do you think that some of the uh, racist dog whistling that we're seeing, some of the efforts to deny, uh, uh, to gerrymandering, often race-based gerrymandering, voter suppression, disproportionately targeting people of color, the efforts to deny the teaching of legitimate uh, American history, our legacy of hundreds of years of uh, slavery, segregation, and the like. Do you think that there's a kind of, um, there's a kind of uh, covert theological justification there? Or do you think that it's more of a kind of um, just about power? Um, there are writers on the Christian right who have openly said that they believe in a racial, racial structuring and hierarchy in which the white race is preeminent. It's more often, it's not nearly as like, it's not the explicit doctrine like I just described the male headship thing. It's more often more subtle than that, um, at least in public presentation. Uh, but I think that a, a major factor in American culture right now is a pushback against a genuinely multicultural society in which everybody has an equal place at the table. And, and it is interesting that when Barack Obama was elected president, the, the Christian conservative world went crazy with resistance of sometimes the most obnoxious type. So, so I think a lot of what we're dealing with in our society right now is an unwillingness to really grapple with a deep structure of thinking in which the idea is that white people were supposed to be in charge. Yeah, it's really interesting. And I think in order to sort of achieve the political goals, sometimes there will be a focus on an issue that frankly, it's, you know, the, the movement, you know, litigates the, the traditional culture wars, issues like abortion, same-sex marriage, and the like, but they'll create new culture war issues um, in order to, um, you know, draw people into, into, you know, to support their movement. Um, well, if I could say one, one thing I noticed in talking to some folks local to where I live, what a lot of them are really afraid of is that if everybody, if everybody has equal rights, then the people of color are going to treat these white folks the way that the white folks have been treating them. And it's a very real thing. I mean, they are, they, they, they are concerned that they're not going to be treated nicely. That's amazing. Yeah, it's <laughs> truly amazing. Well, that's Welcome sad. to my world. <laughs> <laughs> so the religious right is not just um, about a set of ideas. It's a, it's a leadership-driven political movement that operates through the courts. It operates through state legislatures. And again, it sort of crafts culture war issues and also litigates the old culture war issues. And um, uh, I remember I attended a 2014 or 2015 gathering of religious right leaders and strategists and allied politicians. Every single speaker stood up there and said, we've got to talk about transgender issues. And this was not an issue that was on the radar. For most people in America, this is certainly not an issue that was coming up from the rank and file. But they were sort of creating this new issue because it was a way for them to you know, create an identity issue that everybody could get upset about or whatever, and also to pretend that they were defending women's rights, defending women while they're seeking to strip away women's rights in the most fundamental ways. So Mitchell, you've been tracking some of these initiatives. You've been tracking how these sort of don't say gay and anti-LGBTQ bills have been working their ways through state legislatures. And I want, to, I want you to speak to that a little bit, what, what you've observed. Well, for one thing, I think there's like over 300 pieces of legislation now in America that are going to affect transgender people. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, my blood just boils thinking about this because it's, it's so disgraceful. And a lot of these folks think, I, I do believe sincerely that a lot of these folks think they're doing a good thing. But they really just don't understand what transgender people are all about. And 
you know, the, the, the leadership kind of sees it as this tool to gain power. Exactly. But the people that are on the front lines, like I'm, I'm involved with the uh, book banning in Catawba County where I live and have been going to the school board meetings. And I don't think the people on the school board are mean, horrible people, but they really don't know. They're, they're ignorant. They lack knowledge of what transgender people are all about. They fear it. They fear that their kids going to school, if they learn about transgender, that maybe they're going to become transgender. They don't understand this is the way a person's born. And what, I guess what just bothers me so much about the leadership of the religious wrong is that, <laughs> because I really have to discipline myself not to say religious right, because they're not right, and it's part of the game of code language, but um, is that they've picked on this small minority of people who, I mean, whatever emotional difficulties I had growing up gay, transgender is really super difficult for a lot of kids. I, my, my cousin's transgender, so I've really been close with her transition and everything over the years. I mean, it's, it's just enormously difficult. And then to have adults picking on you, telling you that, you that you can't use this bathroom or you can't play this sport or you can't dress this way or you can't take this medication. I think this is going to go down in history as like one of the most mean-spirited, horrible things. David, you were speaking at some point about the use of eliminationist language. We're starting to hear a lot of very sort of extremist language around some of these issues. I am increasingly alarmed uh, <coughs> about, I mean, eliminationist, that term is used in Holocaust studies to talk about when rhetoric or policy becomes um, and reaches a point of such ex extremity that the idea is this group should not exist. This phenomenon should not exist. It must be eliminated, can easily morph into they must be eliminated. Um, and so I, I also think, I've noticed this strategy for a lot of years in the, on the Christian right. I think that the Christian right continually loses battles like gay marriage, for example, and when they lose, they just get angrier. And, and so I think that, and they tend to fall back to the next battle line. And I think the, the, the fallback battle line right now is transgender. Or they'll create a battle line. Create a new battle line. So yeah. now it's going to be that. We, we're not going to talk about gay marriage as much anymore because we lost for now. But transgender, we can, we can maybe make some hay out of. But when you target people for political demagoguery like that, it is immoral and it is dangerous. It's also a way of, I think about some of these uh, culture war issues. Is, do you guys know this, the cat toy that puts like a little red laser on the, on the ground? Mm -hmm. And so the cat chases the little red laser. But I, I think of it like that. You, you get people to look at this issue that frankly doesn't affect their lives uh, at all. And, and they're not looking at what's happening with economic policy. They're not looking at what's happening, broadly speaking, with social policy, environmental policy. I mean, this is a movement that claims to stand for the American family, and yet they're endorsing, they're driving support for politicians whose policies are actually making it a lot harder for most American families to succeed, stripping them of access to affordable health care, education, and the like. So. Um, so if we're talking about culture war issues, we have to talk about abortion, of course. A clear majority of Americans describe themselves as pro-choice, and an even larger number support <laughs> abortion access uh, in wide variety of circumstances. But many Americans still don't understand the extent to which bans on abortion will reach very deep into maternal fetal medicine. Then David, I. I uh, wonder, I know you've had some personal experience. I wonder if you'd be willing to share that. Um, I would like to say that, I mean, my own, I, I've been morally uncomfortable with abortion ever since I started paying attention. Uh, there's nothing to celebrate about um, the tragic choice that is sometimes required for abortion. But, but I think what we now know is that these, these uh, states that are uh, banning or sharply restricting abortion are also sweeping up and blocking, blocking access to 
to maternal and fetal medicine that um, is absolutely essential care. Um, in my own experience, uh, we had three healthy children and then two fetal demises that were mysterious where my wife lost the baby for no obvious reason uh, about halfway through the pregnancy. And when that happens, you have to be able to get health care uh, to, um, to deal with what has already died. Um, and if you can't get health care and you can't get it in a timely fashion, it can be a threat to the survival of the mother, of the woman. You could, you could hemorrhage or hemorrhage. you could die of sepsis. Right. <clears throat> and so, so if you are to be pro-life, then one would think you would want to write laws that don't have women dying unnecessarily because they can't get health care. Mm. So Mitchell, you've never shied away from difficult conversations. And it's one of the things that makes you wonderful. <laughs> you, you get in there with people um, that think in very different ways than you do. And in fact, um, sometimes you're actually persuasive. You know, you've engaged with religious leaders, with community members. Um, so can you give us some tips <laughs> about how to, um, what kind of frame of mind you put yourself in, and also how you've been able to be persuasive over time? I think one of the uh, things that really was a significant impact on my life was early on I had a media training. <clears throat> this is 20 some years ago. And uh, uh, Bishop Gene Robinson was part of the media training. And I went into the media training wanting to talk about, well, what, you know, what do I do if I get on Fox? Or what do I do if I get across from somebody like Reverend Gushy used to be? You know, how, 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 how do I fight with these folks? And Gene said that when he goes into a studio, the first thing he does when he goes into a room where he's talking to people is he wants to bring joy to that room. And unfortunately, there's a couple of people in the audience who used to work for me, so I think they would not say that every time I walked into a room, <laughs> I brought joy to the room. But in these instances, I, I do, I, when I get into it, I, I, I go from the position that I've learned that so many of these folks, they just don't know what they're doing, if we're, if they know not what they do. And um, I've learned over years that, well, I guess the best example I can give you is, um, I was being interviewed by uh, Scott Shepard uh, um, when I started Faith in America, when I started this organization. And we're in Union Hall train station in Washington, and we're talking big, gruff guy, six foot two, you know, football player type. And it wasn't a cream puff home furnishings interview, but this was more a political interview. And he just looked at me and he said, you know, I don't understand something like you're successful furniture, business guy, you, know, you make great furniture. In fact, my wife and I, the only thing we agree on is your leather chairs. We're getting a divorce, she's getting one, I'm getting the other one. But, um, you know, I just don't understand, like, why are you doing what you're doing? Like, why are, you why are you spending this time and money doing what you're doing? And it was one of these moments where I'd never really talked about this, but I just looked at him and I said, because I don't want one more kid to go through what I went through when I was growing up. It's so unnecessary and so torturous. And I started telling him about my young years and the suicidal thoughts I had and so on, but I was looking at the ground while doing it mm. because I was just, I became so teary-eyed and so emotional about it. And then when I looked up, he had tears in his eyes and he said, I had no idea that's what a gay kid goes through. I thought gay rights was about like 40-year-old couples who want rights and benefits. And it was a huge um, thing to me. I was like, all of a sudden I realized, wow, that, that's what the problem is. And I started, then started talking to more and more people and just explaining to them what gay kids go through, what LGBT kids go through. Very simple education process and not yelling and screaming at anybody, although I'm furious at them often, the way they treat their kids. Um, but I found that that really changed people. In, our, in the community where my factory is, it's 37,000 people, 14 traffic lights, 92 churches, and three of those churches are not fully affirming, but at least they're welcoming, and they don't teach homosexuality as a sin and stuff like that, but, but by and large, the community is very um, non-affirming religious. 
we have a gay-straight alliance in the high school. The, the community next to us, which is considered more liberal, doesn't have one. But the reason we have one, and it wasn't my idea. It, I didn't fight for it. But what I learned was uh, the teachers that wanted to do it with the students, when they presented it, the administration, the school board voted, said yes. And it was because largely of all the times before that I had spoken about these things and educated them. And in fact, the week after that happened, the town supervisor called me and he said, I just want to thank you. And I said, for what? And he said, you know, I have a daughter. She's just becoming a teenager. I'm Southern Baptist. I don't know if she's a lesbian or not, but I do know that if she is, I will never lose her. That because of what you've taught me, I will never, I will never lose her, I will never condemn her, and if my religion uh, ex expels her, they're expelling me too. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the real thing, is just to talk in a, in a calm way and to educate people. It, it, this is real, this isn't, I don't need a whole bunch of statistics, um, it's, it's a very real thing and just appealing to somebody's sense of humanity. Yeah, you know, it's interesting to hear you talk about these conversations and it actually makes me think about your friendship. You guys have been friends since 2007 when, David, I know your position on some of these issues has really shifted over time. So I'd be really curious to hear how this friendship came about. Well, I will start because I started the friendship. Okay. Um, Somebody, I think it was Reverend Mel White, had suggested that I read a book that David wrote called The Righteous Gentiles of the Holocaust. And I'll just start by saying, in my life, there have been you know, a half a dozen things that have really, really impacted me. And reading this book really had that impact. And David's thesis in the book was, how did Hitler come to power and say, you know, the Jews, they shouldn't be able to hold public office? And by and large, the people in Germany went along with it. And how did um, Hitler say, well, you know, the Jews, they shouldn't hold property anymore. They shouldn't own businesses. And by and large, German people went along with it. And then it became, you know, the Jews, we really should move them to a separate part of town. And then eventually we should put them in cars and take them away. And his point was they were able to do that even though Hitler might have said it's for economic, you know, they're ruining the economy, or it's the money changers, whatever. Um, but it's because for centuries the church had taught that Jews were sinners and an abomination, that they hadn't accepted Christ as their savior, and it was this, that they were the moral decay. And I was sitting there thinking to myself, that is exactly what it is with gays. That's why they don't want to uh, us to be married. That's why they don't want to have to serve us in a restaurant. That's why they don't want to have to bake a cake for us. Um, it's because of this thing about sin. And I, I just, it just blew me away. So I said, I got to meet that guy. Hmm. And um, I tracked down that he was at Mercer University. I found a number for him. And I always have a reason to travel anywhere. So I'm going to visit a store or something. And I, was, I called them up and said, I'm coming to Atlanta. I'd like to have lunch and talk to you. And I said it um, that I wanted to because I had, in college, studied the Holocaust. So the book really resonated with me. And then during the course of lunch, um, I don't know if you remember this, I said to you, after we talked about the Holocaust and your book and stuff, and I said, you know, you're a really nice guy. <laughs> and then with Bob Hope comedic timing, I just waited. And then I said it again. I said, no, I mean, really, you're a really nice guy. And it kind of surprises me because the things you say about traditional marriage, because I'd read some sermons or something, so you know, the thing that when you tell a 15-year-old kid that they can't get married, that they can't have, that they don't have, they can't look forward to that intimacy, not just sexual intimacy, but the intimacy, the emotional intimacy, that's devastating to a kid. That's why kids jump off of bridges. That's why kids hang themselves in the closet. And um, David just looked at me and said, well, you know, I love LGBT people. I don't want to hurt anybody. And I said, I know that. I'm different than any other, than most other gay advocates. I'm very straightforward about this. <clears throat> I want people to understand the harm that they're causing. And then we had a little bit of a conversation about it. And, um, I've also learned in selling 
um, you can't close, you can't, most often you can't close the sale right away. So I just wanted him to think about that. <laughs> and then um, we, we kind of stayed in touch, um, but I've had a lot of people that I have had those conversations with. And then it was, I can't remember if it was a year or two later, we talked and you said that you had talked to your sister about it. That you were, that you, that you had other people besides me, obviously, and you were influ you were getting influenced. And I think you said, um, yeah, I told her that I'm really starting to change. And she said, Phew, cause I'm a lesbian. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. And then um, yeah. time progressed and uh, David eventually, I guess it was 2016. 2014. 2014 wrote a book called Changing Our Mind. Um, and, and the other thing I just want to mention about that is gay advocacy leaders, whenever I would bring this up about having conversations, they would say, you can't change these people's minds. You can't change their minds. And he writes a book called Changing Our Mind. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, my, my life changed direction after that lunch. Um, I was the kind of soft traditionalist, you know, I was, I was never a demagogue, uh, but I, I just never, I never had, this, never had the space or took the space to reconsider the tradition that I had inherited. I mean, Southern Baptist background, all that, right? Mm -hmm. but, um, but you helped me to begin a reconsideration process, and then when my, my youngest sister came out, and she said, one reason I haven't come out to the age of 38 is because you were a Southern Baptist minister. I didn't want to lose you. Wow. And, um, and then I was also in Atlanta, and for the first time in my career, I was around openly uh, gay uh, Christians. And so anyway, finally by 2013, 2014, I had, I had changed my mind enough to write this book, and this book is now what people are mainly going to remember my career by, I think. Yeah. Uh, that book is all over the world, and I hear from people every day who say, you've helped me to accept my child, or the kids say, uh, can I talk to you because my, my parents have kicked me out, or will you be my pastor, <laughs> will you be my, one person not long ago said, will you be my dad? <laughs> um, you know, it's really the, so everything you said about harm is true, and alienation from family is a profound harm. And so I am now a fierce advocate to end this tradition of contempt, to, to, to no longer heap that harm on people, and to keep families together. And that, that so I want to say, you, you, it could not have happened without, I'll put it this way, God bringing you into my life at the right time. Hmm. That's the way I would say it. Okay. Vice, vice versa, Thank because you can be uh, <laughs> something to really... <clears throat> You know, as a business person, if I have a problem in a store, <clears throat> I go to the store and I find out what the problem is. Is it the advertising? Is it the salespeople? Is it the product mix? What, 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 is the re what is the root of the problem? And for me, in the, the quest for full legal and spiritual equality, the singular thing is the sin business. And it really, you know, helped me get focused on that. And I don't know if I'll see it in my lifetime, but if, if in my lifetime I see all the progressive advocates take the mantle of it and speak with one voice about it and really educate the world about you got to stop this sin stuff, um, I'll die peacefully. Hmm. Well, I think that a lot of folks have become really alert to the threat of religious authoritarianism and its consequences and the different ways that it operates and the fact that religious authoritarians almost always find a scapegoat to, uh, for people to sort of project all of their problems and, and to blame for their problems. And it's, you know, a way of sort of creating this sort of poli this, uh, grievance politics, us versus them, the pure versus the impure. And it's a tool that authoritarians use to consolidate their power. And it's not just unique to America's would-be religious authoritarians. It's a dynamic that we've seen all over the world. Um, David, you have a forthcoming book titled Defending Democracy from Its Christian Enemies. And you compare the role of religion in authoritarian movements, um, not just uh, you know, in, in Russia, in Hungary, uh, you draw examples from history and you also talk about the American context. So can you tell us a little bit what you've learned about 
uh, the role of religion in consolidating authoritarian forms of political power? My observation is um, that in societies that were shaped by European culture in which Christendom, Christian civilization, was the paradigm, um, the loss of Christendom and the movement towards democratic pluralism has always evoked uh, a certain part of the population and the politicians towards backlash. And you can see it from the beginning of modernity. Uh, and I start off with the French Revolution as my first case study and then what happened after that. So um, I, I propose that authoritarian reactionary Christianity is a good label for an international tendency of Christians and their leaders to react negatively to modern democratic pluralism, which includes equal rights and, and uh, LGBT rights and so on, right? Um, and that politicians, shrewd politicians, have discovered whether they believe it or not, it's a really good way to come to power. It's to play on the, on the resentments and fears of Christians who, who resent living in a society in which their values are not uh, legally enshrined. Where they don't have privilege over other people. Over others the way it used to be in yeah. Christendom. Um, and I think that the idea to legally establish um, Christianity to, to marginalize or suppress others and to legally establish Christian morality um, as the law, it never really goes away. Mm. And um, so a lot of the hysteria that I think we see on the right in multiple countries is negative reaction to pluralistic societies in which Christian values as they see it do not always prevail, and a desire to find a strategy to reverse that reality. And I think that equally describes Hungary and Brazil under Bolsonaro and uh, 19th century France and early 20th century Germany and the U.S. So um, it's not just a U.S. thing, but the U.S. is a major place where it's happening and it, it, it isn't over. It's not just about Donald Trump either. Uh, uh, it's about a way, of, a way of looking at the world that isn't going away. And yet more Americans, I would say, reject the politics of division and conquest that this movement represents and believe that uh, the principles of equality and pluralism and justice uh, represent the best of the American promise. And I, I'd love to hear your thoughts, Mitchell, about, you know, we've, you've spoken about how we need to articulate a more positive vision of American values, and we need to say it louder and more frequently. I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Well, I think that, um, I mean, the good news is people want to be happy. And, um, you, you, know, I, I, you know, whenever I'm talking to a family that has a, 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 a well, especially a family where they think their child is gay, and then I say to them, you know what, if you think it, just make sure that the home life that you're creating says to that kid that it's okay. Like if you see a, a gay couple, you can say, you know, oh, isn't it nice that those two found each other? Um, you know, but, but creating this environment of kindness is, 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 is really the, uh, the road to it. Yeah. So. Pretty simple, isn't yeah, it, it's, in it's, some ways? We, we, we have to have more kindness. It's, it's just, <laughs> gosh, it's just so impossible. But um, and I think this school board experience for me has been really interesting in the past few months. And I've made it a point to meet especially the school board members who are um, uh, non-affirming um, and just challenge them in a soft way. Like th they're all hot and bothered about these books. And I say, well, you know, the book that you're talking about, have you read the book? <laughs> or are you, you're just concerned about these eight curse words? You've got a piece of paper that have the eight curse words, but have you read the book? There's a book called uh, Me, Earl, and the Girl. Has anybody heard of that book? Oh. It's the sweetest book. But they use the F word and the P word in there. You know, and that's what they're all up in arms about. And I said to her, have you read the book? It's the sweetest book imaginable. But this is the way some kids talk. Now, if you don't want your granddaughter to, to hear that language, then don't have her read the book. But by the way, also make sure that she never listens to a Donald Trump rally. Oh, my gosh. And when I said that to her, she was like, because <laughs> you know that that's what's on TV in her house. So um, there you go. 
David, what gives you hope? Uh, my students give me hope. Um, I teach college students and seminary students who are training for ministry, and um, they, most of them, or many of them, especially the seminary students, have been raised in the conservative religious subcultures that uh, we've been kind of talking about some tonight, and pretty much to a person, they have left and are hoping to do something different. Um, but for the, so I see there's going to be a lot of churches and nonprofits and other ministries that are led by these post-evangelicals, and they're going to do good work. Um, and inclusion and justice and kindness are non-negotiable values for them. And a lot of religious uh, leaders are also standing up as well. Right. Uh, the, there is a robust counter-movement to this right-wing politics and Christianity, and I'm, I'm around such folks all the time in academia and in church circles. So um, it's a substantial struggle, but there's a, lot, there's a lot of folks out there. You know what's interesting? Among the young, my, like my 18 to 22-year-old students, there's a lot of them, sadly, who are really turned off to religion because of what they've seen. I mean, if you're, if you're 19 years old, 18 years old, think, I mean, think of what you've witnessed in the last few years. They're going to be marked by this. I understand by polling, they're the least religious generation that we've ever polled. But I hope that they won't give up on good religion, good values, uh, and I think there's a lot, a lot to, to reclaim there. But there's a lot of detoxing that has to happen, too. So anyway, the young give me hope. <laughs> How about you, Mitchell? Before I answer, I just want to say that there was a time when I hated all religion. <laughs> and, and I didn't really understand that there was such a thing as good religion, because I, of being where I lived, it, it really didn't see it. But um, Corey Johnson, who many of you might know, uh, I had him work on a project for me. And I wanted him to find all the good kind of religious organizations out there. And he turned me on to lots of different organizations. I called, met the people. And uh, I really learned, and, and from people like David or Reverend Stan Mitchell, that there's this, and, and Reverend Jimmy Creech, there's this whole bunch of people that use the religion to do good things. And it's really beautiful stuff. It might not be my cup of tea to go to church or synagogue every week or whatever, but there's really good stuff out there, and it's great for people. What gives me hope is older people. <laughs> and um, I tell you, three and a half years ago, I semi somewhat mostly retired from my business. And it gives me a lot of time to think. And I've, re I've come to the conclusion that I definitely am smarter than I was four years ago. And I'm definitely, I think, more mellow and nicer than I was four years ago when I was in the fray of battle working every day. And when I look at Joe Biden, he's a really smart guy. And he's learned a lot. I mean, just this thing, that, this coalition that he's put together in Ukraine, that is no easy thing to do. And he, is, he used his wisdom to do that. And if you look at using Joe Biden as an example, he didn't always feel the way that he feels now about LGBT people. He would not have 20 years ago been an advocate for transgender kids the way that he is now. Hmm. Um, there's a lot of older people that have a lot of wisdom. And you know, from David's not older, but I'll call it some younger middle-aged to- You're a very uh, nice man. To, Thank uh, you. Uh, <laughs> to Tony Campalo, who I guess in his late 70s- He's in his 80s now. Yeah, but, but in his late 70s made hmm. a significant change. He's a big figure in the evangelical world. Yeah. Um, I come across a lot of older people who are more mellow and, and are more accepting. Hmm. Listen, thank you. That's old and the young, and uh, there's hope out there, and hope is in the struggle, and uh, it's wonderful to be in conversation with you both. So thank you so much, sure. and thanks to everybody here yeah. for joining us.